Are there any questions uh, before we get started? Okay, yeah, so, so we have been talking about the... <laughs> Mike, that's Mike, you have a question. Oh, I have no, no questions. <laughs> no? 11.59 is still Tuesday, right? Well. <laughs> what do you mean? The exam's due on Tuesday, right? <laughs> that's today, right? What, did they get a date wrong? <laughs> no, that's right. Anyway. 11.59 still counts, right? 11.59? Yeah. He says before 12. Oh, before 12. Okay. Okay, you learn about uh, things like radon transform in the beginning of the chapter and then things like uh, protection slice theorem. And this essentially says that if you have a projection of an image, say if you have an x-ray film layer, and then if you shine x-ray on an object, then it's going to cast a shadow in the x-ray film, and this we call projection. And if you take the Fourier transform of the projection, you get a slice of the Fourier transform of the object. It's called a projection slice theorem. And so if you, this is your transform, this is your film. And so if you rotate this experiment 360 degrees, you get a Fourier transform of the object. You can reconstruct the object as accurately as you can. So this is the background behind um, X-ray tomography, which is commonly known as CAT scan. Computer-aided tomography scanning. Okay, so I think somebody got a Nobel Prize for that too. To two medical doctors who actually were originally physicists, so they got a Nobel Prize for having invented the CAT scan. And you know how impressive the CAT scan is because you get a 3D image of the human human brain and, and so on if you do everything right. And also. Um, MRI, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging, is also based on this principle in the sense that ultrasound is a little bit based on this principle, but not entirely. And um, I was told by the imaging people that all these people got Nobel Prizes for inventing this. Lotterbor, as you could recall, was a professor associated with the University of Illinois. He was he and another person was given the Nobel Prize for MRI. And if you live at ultrasound, somebody got the Nobel Prize for it too, I don't remember in what context. And so if you do imaging, uh, the impact is very high. And people call this the retinal impact. Because you can see an image, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay, so if you can see an image, it tells a lot of tales. So all these people who produce wonderful images uh, actually got Nobel prizes. Okay, and I think uh, somebody should also give a Nobel prize for synthetic aperture radar. For those of you who have 
look at uh, the static FHA radar, uh, you will see how beautiful the images are on the Earth surfaces. This is synthetic. Maybe they even got a very famous for what? For electron microscopy, which is EM to us stands for uh, electromagnetics, but for a lot of people in this world, it stands for electron microscopy. Okay. And then there is, of course, another imaging modality, uh, modality called the atomic force <coughs> microscopy. Okay, and then there are other imaging modality which is the scanning, scanning, tunneling microscopy. This is then for scanning. Microscopy. I think all these people got a bell prize for doing all this imaging stuff. Okay, so if you can do some imaging stuff and impact the whole world, you can also get a Nobel Prize. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit on how uh, MRI works and how it works because it's somewhat related to the projection slice theorem. Um, radon transform, and you have derived radon transform in three dimensions in your take-home exam set for Mike, perhaps. All of you have derived that, okay? So, you know what radon transform is. So, how does MRI work? I don't know how it works in detail, but approximately I know how it works. Okay, and it works in this modality in the fact that, with the fact that if you have a proton or any particles, particles have to spin with then spins, and these spins respond to an externally applied magnetic field. So if you have spins, you can think of spins as, as an innate property of many particles like protons, electrons, nucleus, and so on. And the spin can either point upward or downward. Okay. So if you have a magnetic field B, a DC magnetic field B naught in the background, the spins in the system associated with the atom, the proton, and so on, tend to align themselves with the magnetic field. Okay? Of course, there will be a few random ones that will align themselves in the opposite direction. Well, most of them will be cooperating and um, align themselves along with the magnetic field, and the other one that flips in the other direction is due to thermal agitation because if you have a finite temperature due to the Boltzmann effect, some of the spins will have to anti-align themselves. And you can think quantum mechanically as that you have split the energy level into two levels. On the upper level, the other one at the lower level. This is a spin up system, this is a spin down system. And the one that is spin up always has a lower energy level and hence if you just let the, let the system be quiescent, then they all drop to the lower level. Okay. So the quiescent state is the spin up state. So spins align themselves that way. And there are plenty of spins in the human body. And where do they come from? They come mainly, mainly from the proton. And where does the proton come from? The proton mainly comes from H2O. So we, if you have H2O in your human body, in, in many things, H2O will dissociate themselves into two hydrogens and one oxygen, right? And hydrogen is H plus, and then you have OH minus, and then, and then, uh, and then the H plus would actually be protons floating around, and they move around very freely in the human body. Plenty of them, okay? So if you can get this protons, spin to align with the magnetic field, then you can actually get them to do something. So how do we get them to do something? 
So think of this proton spin like a guitar string. If you have a guitar string, you can get the guitar string to be taut. And then if you hit your guitar string, it's going to respond with a certain resonance frequency. Okay, those things are very much like what you see in the guitar string. And when you try to disalign this spin away from the upward direction, they will have to resonate, they will have to preset. Okay, so what happens is that if you have apply a magnetic field that is horizontal, and this is RF, which means that it's time oscillating, it's not the DC magnetic field, this is DC. Okay. This RF magnetic field has a potential of getting the spin to disalign themselves or to tilt. But these spins will not respond to any RF uh, E1. They only respond to a certain kind of uh, RF that coincides with the resonance frequencies of the spin. One way to think about it is that if you were to tilt these spins, they will have to preset in this manner. Okay. Once you tilt them, they will have to precise. And this is according to the equation of motion or the block equation. Okay, not, not the block equation that you have in periodic structure, not the block equation that you have in photonic crystal, but another set of block equations due to Mr. Block. Okay, he wrote the set of equations for spin, uh, spin precession, and he showed that once you misalign the spin, they will have to precess. And where is this, where is another common phenomenon? A very common phenomenon that you have seen, something precessing. Have you seen anything precessing before? Yes? A top, yes, a top. A top would also precess. A top would precess, right? Do you know what a top is, Junwei? You don't, don't know what a top is. Then, uh, Xiao, do you know what a top is? What do you call it in Chinese? Toro. Toro, okay, Toro. <laughs> so, for those people who do not know what the top is, it's called Toro, and then it looks something like this. And then you put something in the thing, and then you pull a string to <coughs> wrap a spring around it, and you pull it, and then it rotates. Because it rotates, there's angular momentum. The angular momentum of this thing when it rotates is pointing upward. And the moment you tilt it, okay, this angular momentum P is going to interact with the gravitational field, which has a, a force of mg. Okay? And then this force, this gravitational force, <coughs> actually applies another force that is in this direction, P cross F, and then this force actually causes this thing to precess. Okay. And this can be derived uh, from the conservation of angular momentum that the thing has to precess in this manner. And the same thing applies to this spin. At the moment you tilt them from the conservation of angular momentum, they have to spin in this manner, very much like the top does. Okay? But it only precedes with a given frequency. And the frequency is actually proportional to the, the strength of the DC magnetic field. This is called the Lamont, I think it's called the Lamont frequency. Okay? And for proton, this gamma is given by a certain constant that can be collected by experiment and they used to work for the oil industry and they did have an instrument that made use of this precession in order to detect hydrocarbon in the, in the earth and the NML which they call nuclear magnetic law 
the log is just a measurement. Okay. That has the frequency of um, 2,000. The Lamo frequency is 2,000 uh, hertz, I believe. Yeah, 2,000 hertz was the Lamo frequency. Because it does not have a magnet, so it uses the Earth magnetic field, which is 0 0.5 gauss. The Earth magnetic field, which is the DC magnetic field, is about 0 0.5 gauss. And because of this being 0 0.5, you can work this out to be about 2,000 hertz. Okay? So, 2,000 hertz is not a good frequency to work with. Why is it not a good frequency to work with? So, one of the things is that you can, you can get all this spin to precise by applying this B1 field. This B1 field will tilt, will tilt these spins, and they will precise. They will even precise if you switch off this RF magnetic field. Okay. So when they precise, they radiate. As we said before, any accelerating charge would have to radiate. Okay. So all these protons is a precising radiate. We give out the own RF field, okay? And the RF field that has been given out is known as the echo, known as the spin echo. And you can listen to this spin echo with the RF receiver. And if you have a good RF receiver, you can quote unquote listen because we don't, we cannot listen to electromagnetic field, right? We listen with the electronic receiver, okay? So you can listen to this spin echo. There's no actually echo in the sense of the acoustic sense, but it's just a kind of echo in the electromagnetic sense. Okay, you can listen to this spin echo, and then from that you can actually determine how many protons they are. You can determine the proton density of the material. And then you can determine whether this should be hydrocarbon or rock, or maybe some other things that have no hydrogen in it. So it's a very good way to distinguish hydrocarbon from non-hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon would have a lot of spins, and you have a lot of water, you have plenty of spins too. Okay. So, so why is low Lamo frequency poor and bad? Can you think of being an electrical engineer? Why low Lamo frequency is bad? Noisy. Yes? Noisy. Noisy. That's very good. Noisy. Okay. Yes? Low resolution. Low what? Low resolution. Low resolution. That's another good thing. Yeah. Low resolution. So, noise, low resolution. Those are all bad things. Because we always measure in RF field with either a coil, a magnetic dipole, or electric dipole. Whatever we pick up has to be proportional to the time variation of the RF field. It's proportional to omega, omega squared or something. And if omega is small, the voltage that you pick up is small. So we would like to boost this frequency. So the <coughs> then comes nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. And then in, in the beginning, it was called nuclear magnetic Imaging, but it was a bad word. You know why it was a bad word? Anything to do with nuclear is bad. Okay, so at the time we had uh, movies like uh, Prima, you know, things like Prima Island happening, and then we had movies called the China Syndrome. I don't know if you know, you ever heard of this movie called the China Syndrome? And there were lots of anti nuclear movement during that period when. The MRI technology was developed. So finally, the word nuclear got dropped. Okay, it's called magnetic resonance imaging. As you can see, there's nothing radioactive about it. Okay, it's all about spin resonance. So then come the MRI people. Uh, MRI people, they want to increase the signal to noise. So the way to do that is to find a stronger B0 field, a stronger B0 field. And if you have a stronger B0 field, you can get all these spins to precess at a higher frequency. Because this Lamo frequency will get higher and higher as you have a stronger uh, magnetic field. 
And I think the last time I heard was that an MRI machine was built about seven Tesla. I don't know what is the record now. Seven Tesla is a very high uh, magnetic field. One Tesla is 10 to the 4 gauss. Okay, so it's quite a bit higher than the earth magnetic field. So if if uh, so you can see that one gauss is about four kilohertz, right? So so one tesla must be about what? So you multiply by ten to the fourth. It's forty megahertz, am I right? Or is it four megahertz? Uh, I think the number is forty two per tesla. There's forty two precisely. So one tesla I, I take Kurt Schaub's word for it because this was from many, many years ago, about 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago when they were with project. So that number must be quite approximate. Okay, so one Tesla is 42 megahertz. Am I right? Did I do the math correctly? Yeah, 42 megahertz. So if you have seven Tesla, about maybe 280 megahertz. So they wanted to build a machine with that kind of uh, strong magnetic field. But what is the problem they encounter when they have to go to such high frequency? They get better signal to noise ratio. But what other kind of uh, problem do they encounter? In homogeneity. Okay, in homogeneity. In homogeneity, in the sense that. At this kind of frequency, you can do a lot of engineering to ignore the inhomogeneity. But at this kind of frequency, you can still do clever engineering to ignore the inhomogeneity. But at this kind of frequency is hardly ignorable. Inhomogeneity cannot be ignored. So how do you do clever engineering to make the inhomogeneity unimportant? Are you talking about a homogeneity in the field? In homogeneity in the human brain, say I want to take a MRI image of a human body or human brain, your epsilon and your permit, uh, permittivity is actually changing with space. Okay, at low frequencies, you can do clever engineering so that those in homogeneity is unimportant. But high frequency is harder and harder to do clever engineering. So what kind of physics can you invoke? So the inhomogeneity becomes unimportant at lower frequencies. Anybody? What kind of things can you do to make inhomogeneity unimportant when the frequency is lower? Small size. Small size. Small size, low frequency means small size with respect to the wavelength. What is the wavelength of uh, 42 megahertz? Anybody who is very good with calculations, what is lambda? Maybe 10. Can you tell me what lambda is? A few centimeters. <coughs> A few centimeters? How could this be? Or, uh, you are a microwave engineer. <laughs> about six meters? Six meters? About. Six meters? Okay, six meters is quite long, right? So human body will be small compared to six meters. So you, you can con consider yourself to be in the long wavelength limit, approximately in the long wavelength limit if you work with one Tesla machine. So in the long wavelength limit, your body is small compared to wavelength. What kind of thinking can you invoke so that you can do clever engineering? So that inhomogeneity becomes unimportant. You you have an answer? Whatever? No? Okay. There are two concepts that you can invoke in the long wavelength format. In the long wavelength limit, what happens to electromagnetic fields? It breaks into two families. What are the two families called? 
electro-quasi-static and metal-quasi-static. In the metal-quasi-static regime, magnetic field predominates. In the electro-quasi-static regime, electric field predominates. And then there's very little coupling between these two fields. Electric field and magnetic field are weakly coupled. And in the DC limit, they're completely decoupled. Okay, Maxwell's equations broke, breaks into actually two sets of equations that are completely uncoupled to each other. Okay. What do you know about magnetostatic? What is it insensitive to? <coughs> magnetostatic is insensitive to epsilon. to epsilon, right? And then electrostatic is insensitive to mu. So if you work with magnetostatic, you don't have to worry about what epsilon is in the background. So you can push yourself to a higher frequency. Work with magneto quasi static. Magneto quasi static means that you still have time variation. You can have things vary about 42 megahertz. But you stay in the long, uh, long wavelength limit so that you can still think of yourself in some kind of a quasi static long wavelength limit. In that limit, you can think of epsilon as being unimportant if you can design magneto quasi static systems to measure the RF field. So this is this is magnetostatic. This can be made to be a magneto quasi static system by using quarks. Quarks instead of dipoles. Okay, I produced the magnetic field with quarks. RF quarks. Okay. So you can use quarks. And quarks will produce primarily magnetic field, and electric field is secondary. Electric field is a lot weaker than the magnetic field. And you can also listen. You listen with loops, loop maintainers. Okay, so if you look at the MRI system, the off school of loop maintainers, no dipole maintainers. Why no dipoles? Because the dipoles would produce an electro quasi static system which would be very sensitive to all your muscles and your tissues and all the charges in your skin, right? If you listen with a magneto quasi static system like a loop antenna, you listen to the magnetic field. The magnetic field is not sensitive to all the epsilons you have in your human body. So you can do very clever engineering around one Tesla using magneto quasi static engineering system. Okay. But when it gets to 7 tesla, it's a little bit more difficult. The wavelength now is what? Uh, 7 times shorter about 1 meter. So if you have wavelengths of that size in, in the human body, it will even become shorter. <coughs> so you cannot ignore the fact that electric field and magnetic field are coupled to each other. So it becomes a very difficult engineering problem at 7 tesla. So, so there could be a lot of clever electromagnetic engineering that you have to do to get a system to work well. I think they're still struggling with it. I don't know how well they're doing uh, with respect to doing the RF engineering part. Okay. So, are there any questions so far? So, then how do we do the engineering in a very clever fashion so that you get micrometer size resolution is what they claim. MRI images are on the order of micrometers in resolution. And RF field is actually quite large in wavelength. If you look at this wavelength, 6 meters, right? This is DC. So what can you do that makes the imaging very high resolution? Okay, people are very clever. They're so clever that if you look at what they have achieved is actually quite marvelous. So, what they do is the concept of a gradient field. So they don't make this B naught a constant. They apply a gradient to B naught so that it might be something like B naught plus maybe x a function of z. So that this is still DC, 
you can do a, a lot of clever engineering designing DC magnetic field that produces this kind of gradient. GE is very good at that. If you go and talk to people at General Electric, they probably built the best MRI machine in the world. And they have to build this uh, electromagnet that provides a gradient field. This gradient field can be in any direction with any gradient. Okay? So when this happens, all the spins, depending on where their locations are, will have different Lamo frequencies. Right? So if you can engineer your DC field so they can control this part, you can get the Lamo frequencies of all the spins that are different. Okay? You can actually get a slice of them, a slice of them, across the entire T-shirt. They have the same Lamo frequency. Okay? So now if you excite this with a broadband RF field, say, your V1 is broad enough in bandwidth, that they will excite all these spins to be precession, but each of them will be precessing at the different frequency. But now if you listen, if you listen, and if you're good, you can listen with a narrow band filter. And you can pick up different Lamo frequencies. And each of these Lamo frequencies will correspond to a plane, a plane of spins resonating at the same frequency. And that's where the slice protection theorem comes in, right? Because you're taking a slice and you're summing up all the RF signals that are coming from that particular slice. You can make the slice as thin as you want, but what limits the thinness of the slice? Is your narrow band filtering effect, right? You hit these spins with the RF field, you listen, the narrower the bandwidth you can, you can make your system the thinner the slice will be. Because they are all coded according to space in this manner. So different parts of space will have different resonance frequencies. And then so signal to noise is very important. Okay. And then by tilting the environment and then tilting the gradient field, you can have different slice uh, slices of the image. And then you can apply slice projection field to process the image. So this is very clever engineering, and you can get sub wavelength resolution, resolution that is a lot less than six meters by very clever engineering. And finally, they got the Nobel Prize. I don't know who is the other guy. Okay, I think two of them together got the Nobel Prize for inventing this technology. And then you can invoke slice projection theorem in the processing of the image. You can look at the image uh, very quickly if you do an MRI scan. Okay. So, so this is essentially the, the background of the MRI thing. It's all Fourier transform, and then when you Fourier transform these things, you know you can send in a broadband RF pulse to Fourier transform it and. Part of the Fourier transform corresponds to different slices. You can do a lot of uh, filtering, and then you can do uh, narrow band filtering. And in order to get narrow band filtering, uh, you have to do something called the heterodyning. Heterodyning is a way of stepping the RF frequency. Say you receive a signal at 42 megahertz. 42 megahertz is quite difficult to design electronics. I don't know how many of you have had designed electronic components before. Do you need to design RF circuits in your course anymore? I guess you don't have to. If you try to design something at 42 megahertz, it's not easy. But it's a lot easier to design electronic systems at kilohertz. Because the wavelength then is much, much larger. The definition of a capacitor and inductor becomes more clear. But at the 42 megahertz is not, even though it's uh, 6 meters, if you design some megahertz electronics, it's actually quite difficult to make it stable. 
goes kick off power law, kick off voltage law, and all those long time concepts are not that clearly defined at that frequency. So it's somewhere between 42 megahertz, somewhere between circuit theory, <coughs> transmission line theory, and maybe weight physics theory or something. So the best way is to actually heterodyne this system from 42 megahertz or something into the kilohertz range. Heterodyne means mixing. Mixing the signal so they can get some kilohertz signal out. And then you can do a narrow band filtering. Um, it's very hard to design a narrow band filter at 42 megahertz. But it's quite easy to design a narrow band filter at kilohertz range. And so effectively you get a very narrow band filtering effect. Okay, by heterodyming the electronics and so on. And then the narrower the bandwidth, the sharper the MRI image would be. But what is something that prevents you from designing narrower and narrower bandwidth electronics? Why can you design <coughs> electronics in an infinite way? Loss. Loss? OK. Loss. Why does that uh, prevent you from having infinitely narrow bandwidth electronics? What is that? The quality factor cannot be. Okay, quality factor. But what happens if we keep super heterodyming and then go down to very low frequency? You see, at 42 megahertz, if you want a kilohertz bandwidth electronics, you have to have a kill of at least a thousand or more in order to design a filter, right? If I super heterodyme it to kilohertz, I don't have to have a very 